very quickly, before I introduce our next uh, speaker, which is Dominic Bracco, um, I first want to call all of your attention to the many parents that this Summer Teacher Institute has. It's a collaborative project. We all work together. Um, and uh, we have several staff members from the various area studies centers here today. Um, there is Natalie Arsenault from the Center for Latin American Studies uh, and Claudia Garibaldi from the Center for Latin American Studies. Uh, we have Meredith Clayson from the Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies and Esther Peters behind the camera, excuse me, behind the camera, uh, also from the Center for East European Russian Eurasia Studies. And finally, we have Connie Yip, um, Abby Newman, and Myra Sue, all from the Center for East Asian Studies. These are all of the Area Studies Center staff who work at the, uh, the Title VI National Resource Centers funded by the Department of Education, um, who are, along with me, are uh, responsible for putting the program together today. So please join me in giving them a round of applause. <laughs> know that you can come to us if you have any questions about anything. Um, we're all ready to, to help you and provide any inf information in any way that we can. So um, now our next speaker is Dominic Bracco, who is a photographer who explores the effects of global economics on local communities. His clients include the New York Times Magazine, the Smithsonian Magazine, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. Dominic is also a founding member of the Collective Prime. He is based in Mexico City. His online projects include Declining Violence in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, uh, Honduras, Aquí Vivimos, Mexico, Emptying the World's Aquarium, Las Ninis, Mexico's Lost Generation. Please join me in welcoming Dominic Bracco. Um, so, as he was saying, I, I'm a photographer and, is that better? A uh, photographer, I'm actually a fiction writer and installation artist, um, focusing on predominantly the U.S.-Mexico border where I grew up. And it's funny because I, I dove into this work several years, about six, seven years ago, and it was actually at a Pooler Center event where I was speaking to a bunch of fourth graders that I all of a sudden like really had this great eureka moment, which was like essentially what I was trying to get at, at all of this stuff that I was doing, which was essentially like why do people do bad things? And um, it was funny because I was sitting there with another colleague of mine and we were, we were trying to figure out how do we present this material to fourth graders because we just came back from Honduras at the time and we had spent uh, like months covering these like very horrific homicides with the intention of showing the types of situations that people were fleeing to come to the United States. And obviously this content is not always like the best suitable material for young people. But then you, you walk into a classroom and you ask them a simple question like that and the answers are like really surprising. Like immediately they were like, well, you know, maybe they don't have access to education. Maybe they don't have access to jobs. Um, maybe they're doing it out of necessity. Maybe there's a culture of violence or some sort of systemic violence in the home. And these are all real ingredients that are, you know, playing out in a huge way in places like Ciudad Juarez and Honduras. Um, I started my career actually working in Washington, D.C. for the Washington Post. Uh, I was an intern there. And I was um, working for Michael Lucille, who was the photo editor there at the time. And I had a really close friend of mine whose two sons had been killed in gun violence. And so Michael um, encouraged me to work and look at gun violence in, in the community there. And that was kind of like how I started looking predominantly at youth, because like, I was a very young photographer. And it was sort of my way in. I could hang out with young kids. I was only 19 years old. And I did the same thing when I went to Juarez. So in 2010, I traveled to Ciudad Juarez. Um, 
I had moved, just moved to Mexico, and I decided that I wanted to look at what was happening to young people. At the time, not, not even really quite understanding what that meant, and that they were, in fact, the cannon fodder for what became this huge conflict for control of the city. So I was going to draw you guys a really quick diagram so we can flash through this. You know, at the time, we had no idea that this is what this looked like. You know, like, even, like, most of the, <laughs> the journalists, you know, you'd see bodies in the street, but you, and we were, like, labeling this as a drug war, but we didn't really quite understand, like, the systemic infrastructural failures that were causing this violence. So at the top of this conflict, you had two cartels, right? Which is, uh, I'll call it right here. What is cartel? On the other side, you had the Sinaloa cartel. Sinaloa. Cartel, which is El Chapo, the famous El Chapo. Now, the, Sino or the Juarez cartel had already controlled Juarez for a long time. I think one thing that a lot of people don't really understand is that Juarez wasn't only a drug trafficking point. People were not only interested in getting drugs north of the border, but they were also interested in getting drugs distributed inside of the city. Because Juarez, after 9-11, actually became a huge market. Because what happened was once we closed the border down, all of this product that had been moving north and dollars that had been coming back to pay all these people that were distributing drugs, all of a sudden started getting paid in product because they could no longer easily get that product north. And so what happened? That drug started getting distributed out throughout the city and created this huge, huge plaza. So below the Juarez cartel, you had two gangs. One is the Aztecas who are a prison gang from Texas. And then below them, you had the other side, which is La Linea, which was the armed wing of the Juarez cartel, which were actually the Juarez Municipal Police Department. So on this side, you had another gang called the Mexicles. And then you had the Doble A. And these were both gangs that were, well, the Mexicles were both also from Texas prison. So these were people that had been arrested in the United States for some charge, then sent to prison, within prison, formed parts of, of these gangs, and then deported to Mexico, mostly to Ciudad Juarez, where they might not have actually been from. But then once they were just dumped there for years and years, they formed this huge network. So then what happens? Below this, you have what was the section that I, I actually came to this from the bottom. And you have what are these 800 street gangs. That were predominantly the children of factory workers who came in droves to Ciudad Juarez from poor Mexican states in search of jobs that had been made available through NAFTA. So all of these people that had been working in, you know, in Guerrero, in Veracruz, and been making like very little money, all of a sudden the $50 a week wages that were offered at Electrolux to make washing machines or wipers for BMW or Harley Davidson motorcycle cables sounded like a whole lot of money, which obviously $50 a week to us sounds horrible. But what they didn't understand is that being on the border, the cost of living of Ciudad Juarez is actually 70% of the cost of living in the United States. So they were in like what was essentially large, large shanty towns and slums. And these are all working class people and their children who could not afford to go to school and had access to much of anything roam the streets and form these little clicas, right? Um, these gangs use these street gangs to distribute drugs throughout the city. And what happened is when the Sinaloa cartel came in, they actually went into this, say, this side of the room is the Novenos, and this side of the room is the three stays, and you guys have had beef for years. Well, it's very easy to just come in and give you guys guns and weapons and say, go ahead and start distributing in town, and what happens? You know, obviously these two come together in conflict. 
you know, it was a lot more complicated than that. At some point, you know, the army sent in thousands of troops and they were assassinating the street vendors and all kinds of stuff. So that made, you know, violence like totally peak out. But these, the number of young people between the ages of like 12 and 20 years old was like, is astounding. Um, thousands of kids got killed in this conflict. Um, and so I spent a long time, uh, six years working with uh, young people and photographing them. Um, I tried doing other things. I wrote, I wrote a, a fiction narrative um, and trying to like pull together all of these stories and get to what it was. And, and then at some point I felt like I was, you know, in the wake of the Donald Trumps of the United States and that I was actually in some way part of this narrative fodder that could be used to to actually form prejudice against immigrants and the same people that I was actually trying to advocate for. Um, and so it was at this time that I think I had a unique opportunity as a journalist that doesn't happen for <laughs> many of us, um, is that what is turned around drastically um, and went from a place that had thousands of murders a year to all of a sudden having only a couple of hundred, which still sounds like a big number, but when you're talking about 3,000 homicides a year, it's completely different. Um, and so I went around and I pitched this story to National Geographic, and we went ahead and they, and they did it, and it just came out in the June issue, if you guys um, want to read it. Uh, and we, what I was interested in is looking at how Ciudad Juarez, which was the most violent city in the world, could become like far behind many other cities, even in the United States. It's like rank 57th now. Um, and so me as a visual storyteller for National Geographic, my job was to show this city that had come back to life. So I wanted to show pictures of a place that had stereotypically been bodies hanging from bridges, like de decapitated people, to something like this, which is, um, I think, the next frame, where we contrasted the two um, side by side. So this is Denise and her baby Eros and Ulysses, and this is the neighborhood that they grew up in um, below them, and they've actually decided to stay. And both of them had suffered like a great deal um, in, their, in their neighborhoods. Ulysses' house had been shot up multiple times. A friend of theirs, Juan, was actually killed right at their doorstep. Um, and they'd actually, they've decided to raise their baby in this neighborhood. Um, Unlike in 2010, this was a, a pregnant couple who a Sicario hitman came up to the driver's side window and fired around into his head, and because they were embracing like this, both of them died. And so the, this was what I was facing with. But it's like a really nuanced thing, right? We're looking at a place that has reciprocal poverty, you know, systemic violence, um, like major <laughs> domestic problems. So I wanted to, to be very careful in showing this rosy painting picture about Juarez, but also um, show like poverty and the things that exist. So this, um, you know, a working class, both of his parents work, um, and this is in factories. This is the line with the United States here. This is Juarez on this side. Um, so that picture. Uh, this is El Chamisal Park, which is uh, a place that historically had been a a meeting place every year for Easter. It was like a big uh, celebration. This is the first time um, in almost five years that people had actually gone there. And his families were actually spending the night there to, to camp out their space. Uh, this is uh, former gang members who were part of a community building project um, that were going out and working with other gangs, to other young people, to paint graffiti. So. Basically what they would do is they were trying to get young people that were interested in things like hip hop and graffiti and skateboarding or whatever, and they would go out and, and do these projects with them. Um, so these really quickly. Um, what we ended up seeing in the course of this was actually quite, quite interesting in that it really doesn't take a whole lot of people to change a place like this. Um, but it does need to come from like everyone uh, in the sense that there needs to be like a cultural decision to stop 
the, the violence, but they're also like, you really only need like a few leaders in the right key positions to stop being corrupt, right? Um, like a few, like a district attorney that's actually gonna prosecute. Um, you need uh, police that are actually gonna do investigations. You need human rights activists that are actually gonna make sure that people are, f are abiding these um, human rights, not abusing people. And, th and this is essentially what happened. At some point, the citizens of Juarez finally said, like, enough is enough, and we're sick of living like this. Uh, this is a factory worker who, you know, before Juarez, like, nobody would wanna do anything at all flamboyant or, like, you know, even, like, paint their house purple, for example, but because it would draw attention to you because any, like, small amount of money meant that you might get kidnapped. This is a soccer game. Um, public events, all of a sudden, that things that have been really, really dangerous to have public spaces. Um, you know, and life goes on and normal. Before, um, every single business in Juarez was paying extortion, including these guys, and now only um, they think it's like 5%. And the way that they did that was by taking a small group of police officers fresh out of the university and they started investigating. Half of them ended up getting killed in the process, but they were able to um, bring them to justice. And because for the first time, um, Mexico is going through an interesting judicial reform where oral testimony is now admitted into the courtroom. Before, you would just fill out like paperwork and you would go in and present your case. And obviously, it's very easy to mess that up, or it's also very easy for somebody to mess that up, right? If you just pay somebody off, they can mess up your papers. Um, and now there's uh, you actually go in and there's, you have, a, have it presented like a court, like more similar to the United States. Uh, this is a police park that was opened up to, for the children and families of police officers, because one of the biggest things is they needed to invest in their own police force because they're fighting a corruption crime, a uh, corruption thing with the police officers uh, and the drug cartels, right? Because the drug cartels can obviously offer them money and drugs and girls and whatever they want, but you know the city doesn't really offer them much, a miserable pay just to get shot at. So uh, this is one of their projects. Um, this is one of the moments where I was like, holy crap, I can't believe I'm actually in Juarez right now. But uh, I never would have thought like a few years ago that I'd be riding around in a quinceanera, like in a limousine through through Juarez. But this is, uh, and there's, they're not even like a very super wealthy family. This is a, a teacher's daughter. But it was it was just a flamboyant, extravagant party that you just wouldn't have seen a few years ago. The circus came back to Juarez for the first time in several years. Um, it's a party. I just like this little old lady. <laughs> <laughs> um, these folks were, this neighborhood had been really hit hard and they had come in, you know, a lot of the poorer communities obviously uh, you know, I, I think anywhere in the world, they always are impacted the hardest. Um, and there was a lot of human rights abuses here. And they, these guys were telling me about how when the police came in, they just tore down the walls searching for drugs and weapons, and they didn't have any. Um, but this is that police park I was telling you guys about. Um, these are three gang members that were actually from rival gangs. And because of uh, community projects, they've actually become friends. And this is them hanging out at a Salamayuca doing party. Azteca gang member. He eats these. <laughs> um, this is this kid, Poy, I met when he was like 17. He used to be this like emo kid. Um, and he had like all his hair in his face and like super skinny jeans and um, and he like, was like literally the definition of the most nonviolent person I would have ever known. Um, but he and his friends ended up being involved in a triple homicide because some people had come into their neighborhood and killed um, some folks and some of his friends went down and, and shot up another barrio. And so, you know, this this was the type of of situation where you have total impunity and the, you know, the police can't do anything for you. And so people were just taking it in their own hands. A neighborhood park that didn't exist before. Um, building public spaces for kids to hang out. Um, this is a pilgrimage. 
a new water slide. Um, you know, like the gangs and stuff exist, and we'll get into this, but it's it's really been an interesting experience. And even going back recently, I just came back from there. I went to a wedding in this in this neighborhood, and um, it was interesting to see that you know this structure essentially the the city's been split in half, and the Juarez cartel has been sort of split with the whole thing. But because the Aztecas did so much of the fighting, they've actually stayed on top and. Um, they're, for what it seems, in some of the in some of the rougher parts of town, they're controlling a lot of um, the violence by keeping these these smaller gangs from fighting each other. A nightclub. Uh, it's the first women's baseball league. They just opened. I still have male pitchers, which is really weird, but baby steps, I guess. <laughs> um, this is uh, uh, one of the maquiladoras that is actually trying to do, um, they're trying to help the community out. A lot of these factories have been famous for being part of the problem. This, this, the owner of this company is, um, hires uh, like dis disabled people and ex con So is the video? On the first slide? OK. So anyways, if you guys read the article, it gets more into the meat of, of this stuff. But the um, we were looking a lot at institutional changes. So like policing, um, we were looking at the ju judicial reform and how that was functioning. We were looking at some of these community development projects. Um, and so what I was really interested in is what does that mean on like a personal level? Because at the end of the day, somebody has to just say, like, I, I don't want to do this anymore, right? Um, like if you're a gang member or like, and you're in that, in that world and that's everything that you grow up with and that's your culture, like what is it that shifts internally? So um, we made a little film kind of to touch on that to accompany this reporting project. Mi historia no comienza como en algunas películas ni cuentos de hadas. La mía inicia en un barrio pobre de Ciudad Juárez, Chihuahua. Hasta la orilla de los cerros, allá en aquellos vecindarios olvidados por los políticos y personas con poder. Por las noches, tenía un debate conmigo mismo. Todos tenemos una doble personalidad. Para mí era Oso y Diego. El Oso siempre quería estar peleando, destruyendo cosas, robando, asaltando, queriendo estar por encima de los demás, tener el respeto, pero de una manera violenta. Diego era lo contrario, porque sabía que eso tendría consecuencias, Robar tendría sus consecuencias, golpear tendría sus consecuencias. Diego lo trataba de lidiar, pero siempre había un ring en mi mente, tratando de que Oso no saliera. A veces no podía contenerlo por el enojo o miedo que Oso llegaba a sentir. Vivir aquí, crecer aquí, es estar inseguro, Estar atenido a que tienes que pertenecer a una pandilla. Pues nos metimos a camellar un poco con los tipos, embolsar cocaína, marihuana, piedra, heroína. Ya no, pues ya no jugar los carritos, ya no jugar las escondidas. Lo hueles, hueles el olor a muerte que hay en, en la calle. El olor de las balas que pueden tocarte algún día. Solamente tienes que abrir, la, la, abrir los ojos y ver la verdad. Yo tengo potencial para hacer muchas cosas buenas y ayudar a la gente. Ayudarla a los jóvenes a que no sean igual que yo. 
Y ahorita soy tallerista, doy talleres de dibujo, de pintura y hasta de rap. Trabajo con niños desde 5 a 15 años. Hacerles saber que ellos tienen algún talento, tienen una especialidad, una habilidad que ellos tienen oculta y que pueden sacar a flote. Me enorgullece enseñarles a expresarse de una manera buena. Y cuando cambiamos todos, podemos cambiar el ambiente. Y si el ambiente cambia, en el futuro nuestros hijos, nuestros nietos, podrán ver un, una ciudad más tranquila, donde no haya violencia. I'm very scared. Lose my son. Lose my daughter. Lose my wife. That's all my life. Cool. Um... That's all I got. <laughs> do y'all have any questions or do we even have time for that? Yeah, we have about 15 minutes. Okay. So if you guys have any questions, but yeah. How did you maintain your safety Um, I mean it took a long time to work there. Um the the other work that I did before this project was a lot more chaotic. So um I actually in a way that own like that own safety restriction ended up being an advantage because I got really close to f a few people and was able to to follow their lives for several years. Um, so the same like gang members that for the for example the Novenos that I was spending time with actually in a lot of ways protected me, but you had to be obviously also careful because they had other enemies that were looking for them. Um, you know I think every journalist you know, that you'll meet today probably has to deal with this stuff all the time. And I think that we're a little bit more precise maybe in the way that we deal with danger. I think a lot of people in general just feel like, there's a whole country there, I don't want to go there. You know, and I think journalists, it becomes like to the street, you know. It's like, I know this area is unsafe. You know, these blocks are unsafe. I, I can know that during these hours of the day it's okay. And that that's mostly how we work. Um, but it, it's, I always, especially when Juarez was at its worst, I stayed in, its own, in my network. So that included like eating at restaurants and everything. Um, especially, uh, I did that too, yeah. Right. Um, so my grandmother is Hispanic, so I grew up with it in the household. But I didn't. Um, I think I was like a lot of you know kids that have other languages in their home. Like I understood really well, but I was just too shy to speak back, so I just talk back in English. Um, and then in college, I studied, and I um, you know, it started out just sort of as like an inner, like I needed to do it, and then I realized like I actually really enjoyed it. So I got a degree in Spanish literature, and then um, that helped a lot when I first moved to Mexico. But I don't know, actually, all my friends in Juarez really joke with me because I talk a lot like these kids. I use a lot of vocabulary that they use. And so I'm always like really shy to present in Spanish because I like say things like camellar, which is like cameling work for work, you know. So I have like kind of shitty <laughs> vocabulary, but um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I shoot. I shoot. A, I shoot. No, it matters. I mean, I. I, so when I did this project, actually the first time I started it, I, I was like thinking, I'm gonna go and do photojournalism, and I'm gonna like take pictures, and like I was like doing black and white pictures, and then I was like, what the hell am I doing? Like things are crazy here. Like there's no reason to like overrepresent or like dr dramatize like what's already happening. Um, so I just like scaled it back and went to color. Most of this work was actually shot on a little Sony RX1, um, which they had given me. 
it's like a, it has a 35 millimeter lens on it. It's like this big and it just kind of like, it doesn't make any noise. Um, I think you'd been wanting to ask a question yeah. for a while. Yeah. So, Right. Right. Yeah. Totally. Uh, I mean, the organ market, not really. Uh, human trafficking is is a problem. I mean, but it's really shifted down, like more actually closer to like the Valle of Texas, like that whole area. Like when you're looking at Reynosa and. Um, Matamoros, like that area, there's a lot more. But Juarez was, you know, it's famous, I don't know if you guys know about this, but for the, the femicidios. And um, actually, when I was there, I just, I spent several days covering what was the first um, prosecution of a femicidio case in Juarez in over 25 years. And they got eight guys, and they were around, they had them on 11 charges of, of of killing women, and that was all sex trafficking, where they were taking the women um, from these poor neighborhoods, abducting them with the help of the police, um, and then getting them hooked on drugs and um, prostituting them out until, like, essentially they couldn't control them anymore, and then they would just kill them. It's like fucking horrifying listening to those testimonies. Um, but the Actually, amazing story was this woman whose daughter had been killed was like, I'm not going to just like be a protester anymore, and went to college, got her um, law degree, became a prosecuting attorney, and was the one that brought the case forward and prosecuted these fucking guys. So there's like every once in a while little steps to justice. Yeah. Um, like bringing it forward with like, at, like showing it to kids and stuff? Like, yeah. I'm you, sorry. You, you talked about earlier how like, you would be very baffled about the nature of violence. Like, yeah. Like, That's a good question. Right. Yeah. Actually, you know, so be, through Pulitzer Center, I've been lucky enough to do this a lot with kids. And it, I was joking earlier that like, I'm more afraid to talk to you guys because like with kids, I can be like, I'm bigger than you. So it's like less intimidating. Um, but the kids, you know, actually get it a lot more. They see it in the TV, they see it in the news. Um, I find that when it distracts from the story, then I try to pull it out. Because like some groups of kids, like they'll get in there and be like, oh, it's a dead person. Uh, and then it's like, wait, wait I got to get you guys back. And it'll be enough of a distraction. I don't know that the actual seeing of a dead person actually distracts these kids anymore, sadly. Um, you know, I mean, hell, like a lot of these kids see it in their own lives, right? But the, it's enough sometimes I think to like veer them out because they're not emotionally mature enough to know how to handle it. And so they can't see it and like process it and sit with it. Um, and so when I think it's like that, there's a few frames that I don't like, um, but they're, there's not a lot of it. And I actually self-censored as a photographer in this project, which I don't in all my work, but specifically in this work because for me, I mean, one, I had two different missions in like the local Mexican press did, but I didn't want to be perpetuating the terror that the cartels were doing because like they were going out and they were chopping people into pieces all the time because they knew we were going to take pictures of them, you know, and I didn't want to be privy to that, so. I didn't work with the police until this year. I was freaking scared of them, yeah, honestly. I mean, not even that they're all bad, and actually, um, and one of the stories, I just wrote a fiction story, like I have this like hero guy who's like trying really hard to do a good job, but like, everybody's just crapping on him. Because there was, and I covered some police that got killed who were trying to do their jobs. That existed, but it was just scary to know. And I also really didn't want like the other guys that I was working with to be seeing me like cruising around with cops. So I, um, I just didn't for many years. Whereas, like a lot of journalists did, though. You know, a lot of journalists would roll out with the police and cover it. Um, at crime scenes, you could work pretty 
pretty openly. Um, you know, if there was a shooting and you could roll up and, and you would, you know, try to do your, you know, they tried to keep you away, but you could, they understood that you had a function there to report. Um, but this year I tried working with the police, but actually what they were doing was like really perverse because they, I stopped doing it because they were trying to put on a show for me. So they like wanted to look like they were like badasses and they were like, Hey, do you want us to go like, like basically just like go like search some people and like kick their asses. And I was like, fucking no way. And like, unfortunately journalists do do this. I mean, they got that idea for some reason, you know? I mean, it didn't come from nowhere. They're like, oh, journalists getting better, like, because they're tough on crime. And, like, you know, then the journalist is, like, helping them perpetuate this, like, a, like abuse. Um, and, like, I was also sensitive to it because two of my friends, they're in prison right now be for something like that because they were just, like, walking home one day and they got picked up, you know. And Mexico has a very long period of pretrial. Um, like, they don't have to, you don't have to see a, a, a judge for a year and a half. So like these guys right now, they've been in jail. This, I just wrote a story about this for Pulitzer Center. They've been there for six or seven months already. They haven't even had like, and it's like very clear that they're innocent. I'm sorry, and the last part of the question was um, in other parts of Mexico, it's kind of a light skinning and then Chihuahua and other parts of the world for South Mexico. Yeah. yeah. You have the groups known as like the Alto Defensas. Yeah. yeah. Or those groups of like citizen groups that kind of like have come together to fight, yeah. uh, go to fight against against like, is that also citizen class? Like have those groups also developed there as they have no, they hadn't. What has happened a lot earlier than a lot of the other places, and also the auto defensas came from a social movement that had been in existence before. In their own state legislature, they had um, that right written in, um, and so they ran with that right. Unfortunately, the auto defensas have become like really corrupt, and uh, yeah, that's a whole nother. I've, I did some work on that. And um, it's just like the, yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, yeah. felt like geographic was like a good way of getting that dispersed in that way. Because actually, it's funny because so there's this famous Mexican party, the Pre, pre Party. It's like you know hor hor horrible years of, of to like, um, totalitarian government. And then, then uh, anyways, they, uh, uh, it was like a common joke in Juarez amongst my friends that I was a priista because I'd done this like positive story about Juarez and that they were like, because they literally did hold it up and they were like, look at the great work we're doing, which was not at all what I was trying to do. Um, but I do think in the context of a place like El Paso, it was actually very useful because people could look at it and say, and the story's like, I mean, somebody gets shot at the end of the story. It's not like, woo, like Juarez is great, but it's, you know, it's like a pretty real assessment of the place. And, um, I think in, in a brand like Geographic, which is why I wanted to take the story to Geographic, I think it did a certain service for the community internationally and specifically in places like El Paso. And it actually had a lot of traction in El Paso. And I think it's important because folks that a large part of, you know, I don't know how familiar you guys are with El Paso, but El Paso is like the nice neighborhood of Juarez. So it gave people a little bit of confidence to start going back and visiting family members 
it meant that people were going to go back and spend money to go to bars or hang out or whatever, eat restaurants. That was like a huge thing always in, in border culture. Um, and I think that that had, a, had that service there. But specifically, um, I'm not against it, but up to this point, I haven't. Um, right. OK, so you asked me a really interesting one about representation and stuff. That's like this constant thing. I just So I spent five years just writing this fiction story, kind of at the idea that I could address this better. Um, because there's like all this nuance and conversation and stuff that doesn't exist in a photograph. And a photograph is like kind of a dangerously open thing. Um, but then at the end of it, I was like, ah, oh, this isn't maybe really what I wanted. I mean, I'm really happy with the story, but then I'm like, ah. And it, it's not, I think it's a question that journalists need to be asking themselves every day um, about the stories that they do and this, why they're doing the stories that they're doing. Um, and I think that for students, I think it's an interesting exercise to have them look at things that, one, they feel like you know, they can bring a new idea to the table because maybe they're living it or they're in that they live in that community. Um, and two, if they can look at think about positive things. So I did a project uh, with Pulitzer Center and Scribe in Philadelphia with some young girls, and they did this awesome film called "Not Your Mama's Drama," which was about microaggressions, which I didn't even know what the hell that was. And they were like, teaching me all about like, thought and all these words that people use to like, basically put each other down. Um, and then they showed this at schools, and it was like, really well received. It was pretty awesome. Um, and that was something that they saw on their own. It was like, you know, they were looking at the work I was doing, they were looking at the work Carlos was doing, and they were like, inspired by that in a way that was really interesting because they came up with, OK, these are, these are things that are relevant to this topic. And this is like about bullying or whatever, but we're like guarding this. And, um, and they felt like it was relevant to them in their own lives. And that, that's what they were living all the time, which I don't know about, because I don't, you know, I'm not a 16-year-old girl. So they're going to do that better. And, um, and it came out really nice. Um, I'm forgetting Chicago, Chicago. So, I've shown this work a lot of places where there's gun violence in, you know, Washington. Well, shit, everywhere in the country now has gun violence, unfortunately. Um, I think that one of the reasons that I was most interested in studying Juarez to begin with is that Juarez is a really good microcosm for a lot of things. It's really interesting to look at, like, globalization, for example. I went at it at the very beginning kind of as this economist look, and I was reading tons of economic papers about Juarez and, like, why that, how that was affecting what was happening. And then later, I got into this like more dark mode where I was thinking like maybe everybody's just really evil. And then in this context of total impunity, people are just going to be completely evil, which I'm not sure I don't disagree with. <laughs> but there's, I think it's a little bit of everything. Um, and I think institutions, you know, function for a reason, uh, and we need them for a reason. Um, but contextualizing this story specifically in a place like Chicago, I actually think they have a ton in common. Like when you're talking about what really matters at a basic level, it's because Pollo and his friends like got shot up, and so they're not going to let that stand, right? You know, like what are they going to do? They're going to let them. They're just going to let them keep coming to the neighborhood and like shooting people and robbing the houses and raping women. Like they're not going to stand for that, right? Because this is this, but this is a representation of of what um, you know what a infrastructure should be taken care of and they're supposed to, they're kind of like the default to infrastructure right of course this becomes a perverse thing and then this becomes like just about beef and rep and all this other crap that really doesn't matter and that's really what I think the end lesson is is that you look at somebody's story like Poyo which I didn't really get into this point but um, this was a kid that you know they came into his neighborhood they sh another gang shot up the Novenos the Novenos went down to the three stays and they killed like three or four of their guys. And after that, like this cycle of violence just continued on. And many other kids died in the Noveno Barrio, but none of the original shooters died. They're all still alive today. And lots of their friends have been killed. 
lots of who had nothing to do with it. Um, and at the end of it, like they didn't really solve anything. And I think that the end answer, and I think it's very easy for an adult to have this perspective, is it's just sort of like get your head out of the block, you know, like get your head out of this little freaking pigeonhole that you're stuck in, and like realize that the world is a much bigger place, and you're like four little little blocks that you're like protecting or whatever. Uh, you know, actually, Diego, when I was interviewing, him, said this like very clearly. He's like, you know, you're protecting this land that's not even yours. Like, you don't even actually own it. Like, this doesn't have anything to do with you. And like, yeah, that's like your hood or whatever. But like, at the end of the day, like, what is you dying out there actually going to symbolize for the rest of future generations? Or for like, what are you actually? What is? It, what are you going to be a legend for like the next few months or whatever? And so that that's like, you know. I think at the end of the day, like maybe the best lesson, it's like, do you really just want to be a RIP homie, like graffiti on the wall? And um, and more than that, it's like, but it, it's it's a pattern, right? And I actually think that in stories like Diego's, like of course it got a little PSA because it was geographic at the end, but um, you know, you you look at somebody, and I think that all of us have this internal conflict. It's like. You know, this is why I, like, I love that book, Lord of the Flies, even though it's terrifying. But it's like everybody's like a little bit, you know, and we're a little animalistic or whatever. And um, and I think that's why I actually like doing this work is because, like, I was kind of into trouble as a kid, and luckily, like, I had people along the way that were like helping me out. And I I totally feel like so many people could fall into that. I don't care who you are, like, everybody's capable of the most horrifying things, you know. Um, and maybe, maybe that that's a way. But I think everybody's in the same struggle with this, right? You know, that's just my little answer. So, all right. Thanks, guys. Thank